Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation presents Our Story, hosted by the Foundation's Chairman and President, Jason Vialba. Each week on Our Story, hear the personal and intimate stories of Hispanics all across Texas, told in their own voices. Our Story provides insight into a community of people who are literally and figuratively changing the complexion of the United States. This is who we are. Welcome back to the Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation's Our Story. This morning, a very special guest. Again, another friend of mine, someone who I just have such great respect for, someone who has been a mentor to me on issues like education and local politics. It's the great Miguel Solis. He has been a trustee for DISD for many years, and now uh, as he's moving on to bigger and better things, we're anxious to hear from him about his story about the shapers in his life and also about his future, because we all know that Miguel is headed for great things. We're excited to hear from him this morning and welcome, Miguel. Happy to be here, my friend, and very honored that you would include me in our stories. Well, what a privilege it is to get a chance to talk with you. And as you know, on this show, we like to talk about your background, who you are, what made you, you. What were some of the moments in your life and some of the influences that impacted your life? And we're going to talk about that from the very beginning. And then we'll talk a little bit about some DISD and trustee uh, issues and education. And then we'll talk about politics in general, because I know you're one of the more astute studiers of local politics and also national politics. I mean, just to get your experience uh, on the national level, I know that you worked with Pete Buttigieg uh, during the most recent campaign. So I'm anxious to hear about that. So let's just start from the beginning. Where are you from? Tell me about your mom and your dad and any other familial relations that you think are impactful. Yeah, I'm from Southeast Texas, the Golden Triangle, specifically from Port Arthur, Texas. Very proud of where I'm from. It's a city where it certainly makes you or breaks you. And I have vivid memories of growing up in Port Arthur. And, and again, I'm just can't impress enough how proud I am of, of coming from that, you know, hard scrabble community. For our national l- listeners, tell us about Port A. Where is that? Why yes. is it unique for Texas? Uh, what part of the state is it in? So Port Arthur, in many ways, the Golden Triangle, Port Arthur Beaumont particularly, really helped to birth the Texas economy. I mean, that's where oil was found and sparked the, the oil revolution in America. Port Arthur, in the first half of its life, benefited tremendously from the oil revolution. The second half of Port Arthur's life has looked radically different than the first half. And some of that has been the effect of literally planning an entire community around oil. It's the equivalent to the way that, you know, Detroit would have planned its city around the automobile or you know, you mentioned my, my buddy Pete Buttigieg, how South Bend would have done the same thing. And then when you see these places plan an entire community around it, everything else just sort of falls by the wayside. So a lot of people always want to know, is your family originally from Texas? Did they immigrate from other parts of the country? Or are they from another part of the world? Yeah. So my, my family on my dad's side, they're all from Mexico. My mom's side yeah, half I'm going through ancestry.com as you know as we speak, learning a little bit more about my mom's side. Half of them are from Spain, and the other half seem to be from Ireland. But you know, three fourths of who I am has some roots in the Latino culture, the Spanish culture, and background and, and history. But they came to Port Arthur. Grandparents or parents? Grandparents came to Port Arthur uh, on my dad's side fleeing the Mexican Revolution. My grandmother came to Port Arthur as a refugee. My great-grandfather was a mayor of a small town in Mexico who was assassinated during the revolution. Mm. And so she and her mother and her sisters came to Port Arthur seeking refuge. And there had been family or friends, I don't know the complete story there, that had settled in Port Arthur. And so they knew, go there and you will have uh, support and safety. Were there jobs at that time in Port Arthur? I guess it was pre-oil, though, wasn't it? This would have been around the time where oil was found. And so this gets me back to sort of what, you know, what Port Arthur is and what it, what it, how it shaped my family's life. My grandfather, my dad's dad, came to Port Arthur, fleeing the Mexican Revolution, but looking for economic opportunity. 
And he initially came to Port Arthur to work on the railroads, Mm -hmm. but very soon after got a job in the oil fields and eventually, you know, had four kids, my dad included. And when my dad was two, my grandfather died in a chemical spill in Port Mm -hmm. Arthur. And so my grandmother, fourth grade education, spoke nothing but Spanish, then had four kids in a community and a state and a nation that was still to a degree foreign to her. And she had to rely quite a bit on her community, specifically the Latino community, LULAC and others to help really, and the church and schools to help mold her family. Did she meet your grandfather in Mexico or here? No, they, they, she, they met in Port Arthur and it's really, it's a pretty cool story the way it all worked out. So all of her sisters, most of her sisters ended up marrying my grandfather's brothers. Seven brides for seven brides. Yeah, I mean, it was almost exactly like that. So the, the community, and that's another thing that's so beautiful about Port Arthur is that it's, that's not unique to our family. But it sort of happened, and there was a, a pretty big Mexican population in the early 1900s, and still, and still is. It's grown, and the Latino population in general is grown. There's a lot of people from El Salvador, Puerto Rico, Nicaragua and, and others, but the Mexican foundation was established there kind of the way that it happened for my grandmother, and my grandfather. But your grandmother is originally from Spain. No. So on my mom's side of things, that's where the Spanish okay. blood comes. Okay. And that is a really interesting story. As I continue to find out through ancestry, my, I guess it was like great, 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 great grandfather came over as a scout hmm. during a Spanish mission into Louisiana wow. and eventually made his way into the western portion of Louisiana, the eastern portion of Texas. And I have found that there was actually a town named after my ancestors called Lacerda, Texas, which has now gone on to be renamed, but there's an actual Texas historical marker Somewhere like near Natchitoches or one of those, because there are there's like three cities in Louisiana and Texas on that border that all sound exactly the same. But Lacerda, Texas, and my mother's maiden name was De La Cerda. De La Cerda. You've got to go visit that. I, I have to, yeah. And so I've got the marker, you know, on my computer. I know where it is, but I've actually never been there. So ancestry.com, if you're listening, we need sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> we'll continue to have great stories like this to give us background. So your grandfather and your grandmother on your father's side, both Mexicans, mm-hmm. coming into this community with a significant uh, Latino population, but probably still generally Anglo at the Absolutely. time. Yeah. And then your mother's family, having been here for a longer time, lived in, in that same area in Port Arthur? My mom and her family, for the most part, were in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. When the, you know, the ancestors came over as a scout and Spanish mission, it was predominantly Louisiana where the mission apparently was, was happening. So the De La Cerdas all lived in central Louisiana for years and made their money through, you know, hard work and particularly farming. Yeah. The records I can, as far back as I can get on ancestry, it goes to like 1870 something. And the census there that shows that the De La Cerdas were farmers. But I mean, they, the cool thing is that they kept, it, it made the name stuck, right? Like, because of the bloodlines and the kids, De La Cerda from 200, 300 years ago stuck all the way to my mom. Mm. Going back to your grandfather's side, your grandfather dies in a, in a chemical spill. Your grandmother with four children, I think you said, mm-hmm. now has to raise four kids uh, with a fourth grade education by herself. And she relies largely on the community. And this is a theme that I want to explore because I think a lot of Hispanic families have this. I mean, some would, from the outside looking in, would say, oh, you know, you're relying on the government, but that's really not the case at all. Really, it's more familial. Tell me about how she made it. Yeah. You know, I, there certainly was some aspects of the New Deal that she benefited from. Like, for instance, she was able to pull from my grandfather's social security, which would have been you know, very, very new at the time, but was, she was able to benefit from some of that. But the, for the most part, it was, they all lived on the same street, 10th street in Port Arthur, Texas, all the sisters, all the brothers, and that community really just took ownership of her family. Meanwhile, on the education side, like, you know, my, my dad went to Catholic school 
he was basically adopted by a priest and the bishop there. He got a scholarship and they allowed him to go through Catholic school and he graduated from Catholic school. And because of that community, that familial support and the education, he would go on to not just graduate from high school, he get a degree from Lamar University, which is where I ended up getting my undergrad, and he would become a teacher and would later go on to start a successful business of a tortilla factory and Mexican restaurant. He, he distributed chips and tortillas all across the Southeast, uh, and then eventually would go back into teaching. People stepped up. Our community rallied around my family, and I'm a beneficiary of that. I love, I love hearing these stories because it's so important. I think in our community as Latinos to embrace that we're a family, that we're a family uh, among each other. And it's evident in our histories that that's a big component, I think, of how we were able to survive in hard times, just looking to the family, looking to the community, looking to other Latinos that are sharing our experience. Were you close with your grandmother? I was very close with my grandmother. Yeah. Emilia Diaz de Leon. Emilia Solis Diaz de Leon. She, uh, I feel like Ancestry, by the end of this, is going to have need to sponsor this, this <laughs> podcast. But I was able to find my grandmother's immigration papers through Ancestry. And it's really interesting because basically it says like, it says, you know, how'd she come over? And it, the answer is the bridge. There was some bridge that my grandmother walked over and years after having actually immigrated, she got actual papers. But you know, my grandmother was, I can't even imagine what it would have been like to have been an immigrant to this country in the South at that time, having to raise four kids. She figured out a way to do it. And, you know, my dad never forgot that. And my dad loved his mother and he made sure that I loved his mother and that I learned and from her. And she lived two houses down from me. We all lived on that on 10th street. And so I would often be at her house and she would teach me things. And I would celebrate things that, you know, like three Kings day that is not necessarily well-known uh, holiday in traditional America, but it's a big thing, especially in the Mexican community. And, you know, just those little things that you just pick up from learning. From her. Give me a life lesson that your grandmother taught you, something you keep with you, something that shaped who you are. Well, I don't know if I can specifically point to any one particular lesson that I would have vividly remembered her telling me, but I think that one of the things that I took away from her is like, you can't be pushed around that no matter what your condition is relative to society, you have self-worth and, and dignity that, that should be maintained. Uh, and that means something. And so I think just watching her I always, I never felt like my grandmother was poor. I never felt like my grandmother, you know, was less than others. She had a presence about her. She commanded the room and she was proud of that. And that stuck with me. And, and it had, it really has stuck with me to this very day that you mean something, your life matters, your worth matters, and that there isn't anybody that's better than you in any way. And you should, you should own that. You know, one of the themes, again, that I'm seeing as we do more of these podcasts, is the importance of strong women in our lives, in our backgrounds. And this is such a great example, your grandmother being a strong woman. I don't want to make the argument because I think it's based on anecdotal evidence that in many instances, the Latino community is maternalistic rather than paternalistic. Oh, absolutely. But I'm seeing that develop. I, w I wonder if that's a something that's universal you know, maybe it is. I certainly say that I've given you two pieces of data to maybe add to that argument. But here's another one. This is sort of Freudian. So, you know, let me put on my psychologist hat for a second. My mother lost her mother when my mom was two. Mm. So my dad lost his dad when he was two. My mother lost her mother when she was two in a car wreck that my mother was actually, she was in the car and she survived. But there's always been a little bit of me that is like my dad was attracted to my mother in some ways because she had to make it on her own the same way that my grandmother had to make it on her own. And my mom is a very strong willed person. There's a lot of similarities between my grandmother who passed away and my mother. And I think there, there's something to be said about that and why my dad was attracted to that. I think many of us, uh, that maternal... Yeah, I think many of us gravitate towards 
women that share characteristics with strong women in our lives in the past. I know that my wife and my mother are similar in many ways, different in many ways, but similar in many ways. And it sounds like that's the same experience that you have. Tell me about mom and dad. We talked about your grandmother, the importance of that relationship. Mom and dad, obviously they're both hugely important in your development, but tell me about them individually. I've talked quite a bit about my dad's side of the family. My mom, as I just mentioned, you know, she had a very tough upbringing for kind of similar reasons. You know, she didn't grow up with money like my dad. She grew up with one parent, in her case, her dad, but her dad was the breadwinner, obviously, for for her family. And so she ended up being raised by her aunt, who I knew as my grandmother, another De La Cerda, but was really my great aunt. You know, my mom graduated from high school. She was the first in her sisters and brothers, which were her cousins. She was the first to actually graduate from high school and would go on to help my dad in establishing a lot of the things that he established, including the business, the Mexican restaurant, the tortilla factory. But for the most part, I mean, she took a lot of pride in the fact that she was raising two boys, you know, my brother and me, and raising us to be upstanding, you know, community oriented leaders that she knew that we could be and that we should be. So she's clearly driving some of the development of young Miguel. Dad, is is he uh, politically active or involved in these kinds of activities? Or yes. So a lot of my politics manifests from my dad. My dad saw politics in a very pure sense. He saw it as a path to giving back to your community and to helping your community. Again, coming from what community did for him. And so he always saw it as a vehicle for good and instilled that same sense of what politics could be into me. He never ran for anything. He helped a lot of people run for things. A lot of it was at the local level. Although Nick Lamson, who was a long-term congressman from our area, was a very good friend of my dad's. And my dad took, took a lot of pride in their friendship. But for the most part, it was helping people run for school board, helping people run for city council. And when my dad started the business, he was a big member of the Chamber of Commerce and so was active in politics via that chamber apparatus. But another interesting thing about being shaped in a really interesting world as a Latino who was sort of, you know, being molded into a typical American in the, in the melting pot, I don't speak fluent Spanish. My mom doesn't speak fluent Spanish. My dad only spoke Spanish growing up and eventually learned to be bilingual. But the reason why I don't speak Spanish fluently is because my dad was working quite a bit and it was difficult to sort of take the time to teach it to us. But also there was a little bit of like trying to protect us from the reaction of people who hear you speaking Spanish. However, my dad believed in culture and in making sure that we were proud of where we were from, Mexico. He taught me how to sing Mexican songs. And so I can sound like I speak fluently. Estoy practicando mi español, pero yeah. y entiendo mucho, pero cuando hablo es muy difícil. <laughs> so it, I've, it's been this weird dynamic that I've had to deal with for all of my life. And it's just interesting where it all came from. This is an issue that comes up quite a bit. I don't speak Spanish either. For me, the reason is my parents... Uh, my mother, who was from Chiapas, Mexico, uh, only spoke Spanish until she was five years old. But she comes to the States and goes to the public schools in Dallas, Texas. And in Dallas, Texas, in the 1950s, you know, if you spoke Spanish, they tried to essentially take that away from you so that you could speak English. Not not out of a sense of, of trying to derive children of an extra skill, but because they wanted to assimilate people that spoke a different language to English quickly. And so it was not allowed. In fact, back then, as you may recall, or you don't recall, but as you might know from your history at the ISD, they would instruct parents, only speak English in the home. That'll help make this a faster process. Same thing for my dad. So neither of them ended up speaking Spanish. My mom can understand it, knows it, but doesn't speak it regularly. I never heard it in the home. 
And so I never learned it in the home. I've had a chip on my shoulder for most of my life because I, I wish I was fluent. <clears throat> I know I can be fluent. I, you know, I have to take the time to actually get to that point. I'm getting there, but it's this long term iterative process. But in some ways, and here you go, I'm going back to Freud for a second. There have been some things that I have done very specifically as a local legislator that in hindsight, I probably did because I wanted to reckon with this. An example of this would have been, I was the leader in creating a program that now has grown into really a big producer of future teachers in DISD that are bilingual. But, you know, for years in DISD, we have, we've spent a ton of money to go to Mexico, Puerto Rico, and Spain to try to recruit teachers who speak Spanish to come teach our kids how to transition from Spanish to English. Uh, spent a ton of money. It's a huge waste. And we never looked at our kids who speak Spanish as an asset. Mm. Why don't we have them become these future teachers? So that's a great program now. It's a dual language. It's more than dual language, right? Because it's, it is, we are tapping into their skill to then literally give them jobs in DISD within three years of them graduating from high school. So they are filling the gap that we have. And I, I look at it and I go, I wonder if I press so hard on it because it's just like I, I was molded in a way to see it as Spanish as a deficit, something you hide from, right? You don't embrace it to now you own that. It is an asset. It's a skill and it can make you competitive in the 21st century American economy. One of my biggest regrets growing up in Dallas region and having access to that kind of an education to learn another language. I mean, they teach Spanish all throughout you know, junior high and high school. And of course I took it, but never took it seriously and never learned Spanish in the way that I should. It's a deficit to not speak Spanish. You know, the great conundrum that you and I face or all Latinos face that don't speak Spanish is that the expectation, I believe, is that we were supposed to speak Spanish from non-Latinos. But from our own people, you know, that's not always the case. If you don't speak it, you you know. One of the things I, I that frustrates me is you know, you have people come up to you and you know they'll they'll say, Hey, we need a translator. Can you can you come? I, like, I can't wow, I'm, I can't translate, I apologize. Or I'll have, you know, people that'll come up to me and they'll go, Buenos dias, mi amigo. <laughs> I'm like, Buenos dias. Buenos but, dias. Cool. So, uh, right, you know, it's, yeah. so, and, you know, I'm, most of the time they do that because they're trying to be friendly and they, you know, but it's, it's just a thing. You know, in politics and my time in the legislature, and I'm certain you face this at DISD, I get asked to do a lot of interviews from the Hispanic television. I, I, I struggle with that because I believe that our, community doesn't get those that are monolingual Spanish don't get the full information that they need. And some of that ultimately then drives, I'm convinced of this, it drives us not being as involved as other communities. So what I, I tried as best I could while I was a school board member to take those interviews, provided they were comfortable with me being able to read from a prompter where I would type in the stuff that I wanted to say. Mm. That's difficult as a journalist, because if you have hard hitting questions, that you want like answers from, you don't want to give your questions in advance. And, but we worked out a deal where I would be speaking, you know, fluently that became less of an issue when I had people like Edwin Flores come back on the board who is fluent and, and others. But for, there was a point in time where I was the only Latino on the school board. Wow. Nine school board members, 72% Latino, 45% English language learners of 155,000 kids. I was the only Latino and so I made it a point. I said, I am going to do these interviews. I can sound like I know what I'm saying. I know what I want to say. I can have it translated. I was that guy for a few years. Well, I think it's important. I mean, and I, to this day, my, my own children are, are studying different languages and Spanish is one of them. And I'd love to go back and learn it myself. And so that's something I need to focus on. A little bit of that too, Jason, not to, to go too far off uh, the beaten path. One of the reasons why I co-founded with George Balgo and Rebecca Acuna, the Latino Center for Leadership Development, is because as we grow as a Latino population in Dallas, in Texas, in the nation, it is critical that we have more Latino representation. And the more resources and assets we can inject into the conversation, including things like someone who is 
a Latino who's highly educated, who is, you know, bilingual, we should do that. And so that, that was sort of uh, an inspiration. So we skipped over a little bit. I want to go back and cover about your education. So clearly education is important in your family. Your father made it clear, and your mother too, that education is going to be a, a, an impactful part of your life and you're going to do that. How did your parents imbue in you that education, and particularly higher education, is absolutely necessary? It's one thing to go to KB-12, but how was it that your folks got you there, whereas so many of our other communities just don't end up uh, going to college. Well, you know, it wasn't hard for my mom and dad to convince me that education mattered because I literally could see what it had did for my mom and my dad, you know, coming from families that really just didn't have education. One generation, you know, removed from my, my grandparents I could see that because my mom and dad got an education, my dad a little more than my mom, but nonetheless, they both got an education. It tremendously impacted their lives and my life. That said, I was a stubborn kid growing up and like I knew education mattered. I took it very seriously. But then there was a point in time in my life where I radically changed. And that was my junior year of high school because I moved from Port Arthur to Denver at that point in time, which is towards the tail end of my dad's life. He actually left teaching and started working at a job that had him, you know, placed him in Denver. So imagine being a junior from a small town like Port Arthur, mm. moving to Denver, and then going to one of the largest high schools in all of Colorado. I was pissed. And so I started skipping class and I didn't take my work seriously and so, so on and so forth. The short of it is that my dad said, I'm going to make sure that you understand the path that you're going to take. If you don't get this education, I know it because I've seen my own family take this path. And so he took me to work with the crews that he was in charge of that were cleaning grocery stores. And after two weeks of that and, you know, reporting to in school suspension, I said, well, I think I'm going to give college a try. <laughs> but I wasn't completely convinced that, that it was what I wanted to do. So I only applied to one school and it was Lamar University because it was where I was from. It would get me back to where I wanted to be. And then I got to Lamar and that's where, from an education standpoint, my life dramatically changed Why? for the better. A little bit of it was I wanted to prove that I could do it, that I could actually get back on course and take education seriously. But the other part of it was that it was 2004 and that was Bush v. Kerry. Mm. And I'd always been interested in politics, as I, I told you, my dad sort of shaped me to be interested in. And I was in a political science class and I had a professor who told me that young people just didn't care about politics, which is the reason why young people, you know, under perform from a voting standpoint. And that pissed me off. So I wanted to organize students to go out and vote. And eventually I ended up getting like four of my classmates to go and vote. And I was like, well, maybe, maybe that, that professor was right. <laughs> like, uh, but <laughs> I saw on YouTube, Barack Obama give the convention speech at the, the Democratic National Convention in Boston. Was that the catalyst? Because it was absolutely the catalyst. Because your, your parents grew up you know, Chamber of Commerce, business people, your dad's focused on nonpartisan style races. There's no reason you would be one direction or the other. You might have had a leaning one direction or the other, but you ended up being a Democrat, right? Was it Barack Obama? I wouldn't say Barack Obama is necessarily the reason why I became a Democrat. I would say Barack Obama is absolutely the reason why I began to take politics very serious. And the reason why was because he had such a unique story where I was like, that's kind of like my story. Mm. Certainly not an apples to apples comparison, but my grandmother is not from this country. My you know, mom and dad were raised in a way where they had to work hard to make it in America. They didn't come from a lot. My mom, she is half Spanish, but she's also half Irish. And her family looks a lot like, I mean, you would imagine that they are just white people in America. But my dad was Hispanic and he looked like a Hispanic. Mm -hmm. So this like this this issue with race that he had growing up, trying to reckon with it. And I was just super inspired by the guy. And I saw a lot of myself in his story. Had you been thinking about issues before then or was the awakening that you experienced in college the first time in your life when you start thinking through and ticking through the issues that place you into one bucket or the other? The 
esoteric nature of the issues became something I got interested in after following the 2004 race in, in Barack Obama's speech. The spirit of wanting to help other people, caring about the general social safety net, things that I think if you were to look at the Democratic platform, you could sort of find that stuff I always cared about. And I was I was shaped to care about that by my family. But no, the esoteric detailed policy prescriptions on how you would ameliorate the conditions of people, especially those that are less fortunate, that all took shape post-2004. Politics becomes such a big part of our lives once we embrace it like you did. But as Latinos in, in Texas, we also face other obstacles to our ability to really move forward in that arena. You know, Chuck Rocha talks a lot today about how in politics, it's very difficult for Latinos to be involved in politics just because it's a white world. And the consulting class, most of the candidates, even at the, at the lower levels in politics, it's usually going to be Anglos or non-Latinos that are involved. How did you get involved? And even starting in college or before, did, growing up in Port A, where it's largely going to be non-Latino, what experiences did you have that you had to overcome? If there were things that I had to overcome because I was a Latino, I guess I haven't really paid attention to those things or, or they weren't a big enough barrier to stop me from doing what I wanted to do. But, you know, thinking about, I really hadn't thought about that too much, thinking about it. There's been a little bit of me that makes me wonder, like in the recent mayor's race, which uh, your listeners should know that you and I were candidates for the recent Dallas mayoral race. Jason and I were friends before, and we are even closer friends now. We had a lot of fun in that campaign. But there's a little bit of me that wonders, like, how much of our names played a role in how people voted? You're a very bright guy. A lot of great ideas. Regina Montoya is a very bright and accomplished woman with a lot of great ideas. I think I've got a few good ideas myself and had a track record at the local level and had been elected before in a Latino majority district of getting things done. I got fifth place. Regina got sixth. You're, I mean, you're right after Regina. How much of the fact that our names were Villalba, Montoya, and Solis played a role in the outcome? And that race was very eye-opening, illuminating for me. And I came from a background in the legislature where it wasn't as much of an impediment, right? I live in a very wealthy Anglo district where I was able to become a member of the legislature, even though I had that last name. But at the local level, it was almost impossible to break through unless I had the support of the kingmakers. And, and that was something that was unique and Local politics is so difficult to unwrap and to understand. For me, it was the calculus that was so much more complicated than state politics that it was just hard to overcome that. The reason I bring that up is, is just to say, like, upon reflection, what are the barriers that have existed to me? I really can't think of many barriers that weren't insurmountable. But there are some things I'm like, I wonder if my name plays a role in how certain people perceive me. Do you ever experience racism? Oh, yeah. Explicit racism, tacit racism. Yeah, I mean, there is. Well, I think there's a misconception out there that because we are Latinos mm -hmm. and light skinned, I mean, I, I'm not uh, as dark as some of my ancestors. You're lighter skinned mm -hmm. and we have Anglos in our historical lineage that we don't face any kind of, of racism. And certainly we don't face the kind of racism that our African-American brothers and sisters might face. But I, I like to ask that question only because uh, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I have a hundred stories I could tell. Yeah. Is that your experience as well? Yes, that, that is, has absolutely been my experience. It, I have figured out a way growing up to create a way to not maybe see things as much or not take them as personal just because that's just the way things are. But, you know, growing up, uh, I remember there was a time in high school where my brother and I were going to go get Dairy Queen from my mom and dad. They asked us to go out. So we got in the car and I was driving and pull around the corner. I see a cop police officer pull up behind me and sit there for a bit. We're waiting at the red light. Red light turns green. I take a left and the lights come on. I was like, I 
there was nothing that I did wrong. I was right around the corner from my house. I'm driving 10 miles an hour. I took, I turned my blinker on, pulled into a uh, parking lot and the officer gets out. He slowly walks up. He asked me what I've been doing. Where am I coming from? So I was asking my brother questions. And then another police car comes up and then another police car comes up and then another police car comes up. Four cop cars. They get us out of the car. I mean, I don't even have shoes on. <laughs> I'm in my, I'm literally barefoot. And they ask if they can search the car. And I'm like, I don't have anything to hide. Yeah, you can search the car. They pat us down. They put us on the hood of the car. At this point, my, my brother's becoming more and more frustrated and I'm trying to keep him calm. He's a little more hot tempered than I am. By the end of it, I mean, there are probably five, six cop cars. You know, people are looking. There's this big commotion. And they told us that we fit the profile of someone who had been going around shooting out windows of people's cars. 45-minute process that, that we went through. And by the end of it, we went home. We didn't even get the ice cream. And my mom and my dad were going, well, what happened? You know, and so it's like, is that explicit racism? I don't know, but... Why do we have to go through that entire process? Because we were two brown kids in a car who fit the description of somebody that was doing something. And I hear stories like that all the time. And, and of course, people like you and me brush it off. A lot of times we'll tell that story again and almost laugh about it, right? Mm -hmm. Because we are taught as people who have assimilated into the larger culture that that's insignificant, that's too small, but it's real. I can't tell you how many times, and I'm sure you got oh, yeah. this too, how many times you'll go to uh, like a steakhouse or something, right? And be asked, hey, sir, can you, you know, help, uh, can you, uh, I want, we're ready to order. Yeah. Or, are you the manager here, sir? Well, at least I get to be the manager this time, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> I think the area where it, it most uh, troubles me is in the area of education. When we achieve something, you went to Harvard, mm -hmm. you know, you get to Harvard and people uh, back home, say, oh, of course he got to Harvard. He checked the box, mm -hmm. right? He's uh, yeah. He must have gotten a an affirmative action scholarship. Yeah, yeah. And what did George W. Bush say? The soft bigotry of low expectations. Of low expectations, absolutely right. And that's that's so real. There are levels of this stuff, right? So like that stuff is bad, but then there's like losing your life because your skin is brown or black. There have been times where I have been called certain things by people that was explicit racism, calling me, you know, a, a spick or something like yeah. that. I've been called that before. Oh, sure. But for the most part, the stuff that I've experienced has been the, at the level that we've been talking about. It hasn't been like that fear for your life because of the color of your skin. But there are many of my friends that have experienced that. Well, I think that's the difference between our experience, our shared experience, and that of the African-American community, because most of my African-American friends can tell you 10 stories about where their life was directly threatened. Yeah. Uh, as you know, I have a bit of a history as a brawler. That was the same when I was a kid, you know, and I got called all the names too. And I responded by using my fists Probably not the most constructive way to do it, but the way that I knew how to do it. And you have to deal with that. But like you, never in my adult life was I ever in fear or threatened whether or not I was able to get a job or not or whatever. I don't, I don't believe uh, that that has impacted me. But, I, but then again, I don't know. Right. That's the thing is that it's, I leave it open to possibility that it could be a, a thing, but I don't. It's not in my psyche. I haven't, I've trained myself to just go for what I want and then allow my merit and credentials to be able to, you know, see me through. But on a path to politics generally is I saw politics the same way my dad saw politics as this pure medium to doing right by people. And so my first job out of college was literally, I graduated from Lamar University and caught a flight to Indiana to work full-time on Barack Obama's presidential campaign in 2008. I was a youth field organizer stationed in Southern Indiana. Indiana hadn't voted for a Democrat since 1964. Southern Indiana is one of the birthplaces of the KKK. Imagine going there, trying to get people to vote for the first African-American president in the history of the United States. He won Indiana by 40,000 votes. Wow. And the youth vote had a, had a critical role to play in that. So that was sort of like, I got to then think back to my professor saying young people didn't care and be like, we do care. It just takes a little bit more effort. And then after that, was going to likely go work in D.C. 
I had a job. I was on a path to a job set up in the Department of Energy for Secretary Chu, but I'd heard about Teach for America from people that were staff members on the campaign and thought about education, the role it played in my life. And I decided that's what I want to do. So that's what brought me to Dallas. I thought I was going to teach for the rest of my life, but I had a, my principal, Kai Richardson, who's a principal at Marsh Middle School, who eventually would uh, retire from Woodrow Wilson and not too far from your house. And he said, I think you could be a leader in education, but if you're going to do that, you need to go get an education in education. My degree was in history and political science. So I said, well, if I'm going to try to apply myself this time, I want to go where I think I can go. And so I applied to Harvard and I got in and studied at Harvard. And it was a tremendous experience, shattered my expectations for what it could be. The first day of class, I showed up straight up, you know, khakis, blazer, tie, like the, from the paper chase. The paper chase. <laughs> and people were in like, you know, they're scrubby. They're mm-hmm. like in sweatpants and stuff. And so I, I just, go, I thought I was going to get one thing at Harvard. I got something completely different and it was amazing. And then I, I came back, I worked in DISD as a special assistant to Mike Miles, who was the superintendent at the time. And then eventually a seat opened up on the school board. I was 27 years old. And I said, I know how much education has played a role in my life. I know what education did for the kids that I was teaching at Marsh. And I think we could scale some of the things that could have an even bigger impact for our kids. And so I decided to run for the school board and I won and and for seven years served on the Dallas school board. What an amazing story. 27 years old. I remember watching that campaign. You were such a strong candidate that people dropped out. Yeah. And so you ended up getting that first race without having to face an opponent of who ultimately had to face? I, well, that first race, there ended up only being one person that ran, and it was a super political race. But I ended up winning that one. I had to run six months later. But then the next race, I didn't have anybody run against me. Oh, that's I remember having those races where no one ran against me, and it was so delightful. But usually for me, it was because the people cleared the field for me. For you, it was because you were just such an impressive member of the trustees, I think that that it really drove itself well. So I have children, three of them, all in DISD. Absolutely. And so uh, very thankful for you making that commitment. Well, it, it was it was important to me. I'm a public school kid. And I always believed in public schools. So my wife grew up going into private schools. And so it was a discussion that we had to have. I live in the private school district, really, of the city here. I've got five private schools within a half a mile. But DISD was where my parents went and then where I went. I know I went to I went to public schools, but not DISD. Mm-hmm. And I thought to myself, you know, if I'm going to represent this district, I want to understand it. And so we sent our kids there. And it was largely because of your leadership and the leadership of others who really made some differences. Let's talk about DISD pre and post Miguel. Now, I know there's others that participated. I know it's a team effort, but... Mm-hmm. Your thought leadership on some really major issues really changed the complexion of public school in Dallas, Texas, in a material way. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about some of the big ticket issues, and and many of them controversial. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear your your thoughts on what you think the biggest catalysts were, most controversial, and then what you think had the biggest impact. You know, outset, let me say that public schools can be, and in many ways are, as good as private options. It's still true that you have to search a little harder, but public schools can be and are in many ways as good as private schools, at least here locally. The revolution that happened in DISD really began back in 2008, roughly, when Hinojosa was superintendent the first time. There are two major things that he did. The first one was He instituted universal curriculum. It blows my mind that there was a point in time where one teacher could be teaching something and then across town, another teacher could be teaching something radically different, but they were teaching the same group of kids, the same type of kids, the same grade level, the same subject. They were learning two tremendously different things. There was philosophy behind why that should be the case, but On the whole, it doesn't help you understand how you are doing as a district if you have no way to calculate that. 
So Hinaosa came in and he instituted a universal curriculum where everybody was going to be teaching generally the same thing. You could have your own flavor on it, but at this point in the year, you're going to be teaching this and we're going to assess what that's going to look like at the you know, at points of time in the year so that we know how kids are doing on the whole. Then he brought in organizations like Teach for America, which is, again, the reason why I'm even here, which tried to figure out how do we inject new life into the teaching profession by drawing on, you know, people who may have never considered education as a thing, but were, you know, graduating at the top of their class all across the United States. So those two major things, bringing in programs like Teach for America, universalizing curriculum started the movement. And when those things started to get in place, the business community took a look at DISD and said, well, we know that this is critical to the future of our city because it's critical to the future of our economy. And we can get it on board with some of these changes. We're going to start focusing on this a little more and putting our money into efforts to try to help support the school system. And that would be like, we're going to support the bond campaign, or we're going to support funding these nonprofits that you know he knows is bringing in. Then you had the earthquake, and that was Mike Miles. Mike Miles came in and should be given a lot of credit for taking research and turning that into action. There are two words that I hear often, and they seem to be controversial, and I never could understand why that's the case, and you can help me. One is reform, Mm -hmm. and then two is outcomes, Mm -hmm. right? And I think Mike Miles is credited with really looking at educational reform seriously, not the, the small little steps that historically that meant, but really major tectonic shifts in how we approach this. And then to match those reforms with outcomes. To me, that's common sense. Yep. Why the controversy? Well, the controversy is because like anything that touches politics and in DISD, you're going to get politics because you have a democratically elected school board, which has special interest that comes with it. Um, anything is going to be political. But I, I really what ticks me off is the, how this concept of a reform has been hijacked and turned into like almost a political party by people who wanted to create a straw man or a boogeyman to attack the policies through. The word reform is a word that has existed for a very long time since, you know, our lexicon has been established probably. All that means is just trying something new, trying to improve things, right? So when Mike Miles came in, he wanted to reform the system to try to improve outcomes for kids. He took research and applied that research. And the first way you did it was rethinking human capital systems, ensuring that we change what we know will have the biggest impact on the outcomes of kids. And research says that's the quality of teacher that you have in the classroom, followed closely by the quality of principal that you have at the school. So he said, if we know that's what can get us the biggest outcomes, we need to make sure that we value that in a really thoughtful way. So he took an old pay system, an old evaluation system, very archaic, old professional development system, and he blew it up. And he turned the system into one that is rooted in merit and increasing effectiveness for our teachers and our principals. And that change, more than any other change, was the catalyst to the improvement that we have seen over a decade in in DISD. And there have been other things increasing early childhood education, ensuring that it's high quality so that we get kids an earlier start, making sure that we don't forget about our kids who are about to get into college or the workforce by ensuring that they actually have skills necessary to be able to make it in college or to make it in the workforce that are relevant to the 21st century economy, trying to desegregate our city, which should have been desegregated after Brown versus Board of Education, but there's a you know 60 year history of that not happening through things like mixed socioeconomic integration schools, where we're literally engineering schools to be 50% middle to upper income, 50% lower income, and really looking like a very racially diverse school. There there are many different things that we've done, but it all comes back to human capital change. Isn't that amazing? I mean, I remember when that initiative started, all hell broke loose. I mean, the conversations were everything from let's just break up the entire ISD 
to, you know, no way, no how. I mean, it was, it was amazing to me, the resistance to that. And yet five years later, not only have the outcomes been positive for people like my children and families like mine, not only for the city of Dallas, but it's nationally recognized as one of the most disruptive and effective programs in the country, so much so that it's being modeled. I mean, I wrote a bill that I essentially copied the plan and tried to implement it statewide. It ran into some resistance because of there are some other issues in the state. But even that, even your effort bore, bore fruit in, in a way in that comprehensive school finance reform that was just passed by the Texas legislature last session included a lot of, of what we did in DISD and, and accomplished, I think, in some ways, some of the things that you wanted to accomplish with your with your bills. And that was always, that was really always a theory behind some of these initial changes is that they would create this auto catalytic, you know, momentum where other things inevitably were going to change fait accompli because you initiated those critical reforms. You know, people that listen are probably thinking, oh, well, what's just common sense? Well, let me just say, when you started this, it wasn't common sense and you took a tremendous amount of arrows from people who were pissed at you. Yeah. I mean, think about it. A lot of people, a lot of people's jobs were on the line. And, and this is where it's sort of the nexus of race and policy and politics. It's just been, that is a rich discussion where we could create an entire organization and podcast just on the nexus of power, politics, and race. But in, in Dallas, specifically the African-American community in many ways became a middle class through government entities and the, the positions of government entities. I mean, there were, there were a lot of people that got in the middle class because they became teachers or principals in DISD. And the same could be said to a degree for the Hispanic population, but the Hispanic population is still a, a fairly new population in the history, in the life of Dallas. So the biggest pushback that we got initially was from the African-American community. And it, it stemmed from a good place in many ways, and that was jobs and livelihoods. So you, it was having to navigate that. That controversy continues to this day. And I know there's still some resistance to that. But the bottom line is, you know, if the ISD is, is crafted and its, and its focus is on the children, then outcomes for our children are what really matters. And, and I know that's where the controversy lies. And so that versus jobs and, and infrastructure for other communities in the city well, thank you for that, right? Because I just know as a, a progressive, someone who has identified more on the progressive side of politics for to take the position that you took was very courageous and I think really showed great leadership. Again, as a family, thank you. Let's move on quickly because we're getting to the end of our hour. We talk about the future. I know that you, you just left the trustee board after having served a significant amount of time and really made a difference. I know that your very good friend, Pete Buttigieg, is now going to be the Secretary of Transportation under the new Biden administration. Any chances we're going to see you move to uh, D.C. anytime soon? I don't know. You know, I think the first thing that should be said was that I didn't get into elected politics to try to figure out a way to get to some ideal position that I plotted everything around. I ran for the school board. But because, I know you care about transportation. Oh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. But the stuff that I'm doing right now with the, the Coalition for New Dallas, it, it is absolutely a passion of mine. But the point I'm making is that I didn't run for school board because it was the step to the next thing. I ran for school board because I'd been a teacher. I'd been in central administration. And I, there was a way to be able to scale what I wanted to do. Now, I then ran for mayor. Right. The reason I ran for mayor was because I realized there were a set of things that I just was not going to be able to do that were having a significant impact on what we were doing in DISD, housing patterns, transportation policy, criminal justice, that you could absolutely control or have a significant influence on at the city council level. And so being able to potentially shape a policy agenda to help what we had been doing in DISD, that's where I saw the mayor's, you know, race playing a role. Really, 
that's the only position that I wanted to have. So yeah, I've had people ask me, will you run for state rep or will you run for a Congress or, you know, how about a statewide seat down the road? You know, we need to inject some, some youth into some of these statewide positions right now. I'm not interested in any of that stuff just because it's not what I'm passionate about. I'm passionate about these, these local things. Biden administration coming in, the transition team, you know, putting together some names. Yeah, it's something that I have looked at and conversations that I've had with people, but I also got to take into account something that we didn't talk about, which is a part of my everyday existence. And that's the fact that I've got a daughter who had to have a heart transplant. We've grown very fond of the heart transplant science that happens at Children's Medical Center at moving my family up to a place like D.C., or really anywhere else for that matter, is something that I really have to weigh heavily. So I don't know what the future will hold. I'm sure that I'll remain involved in politics and policy in some form or fashion. Right now, all of that is happening through the Coalition for New Dallas, which is the urban policy think tank that I run, focused on transportation, housing, and to a lesser degree, education. But I'll, I leave options open all the time. Well, the Coalition for New Dallas is a very unique public-private partnership kind of entity. Tell me about their objective yeah. and how it is going to change Dallas. And this might be local for our listeners statewide, but I think this kind of initiative is going to be impactful really all around the state. Yeah, it's, re- it's really, it's actually really not too, too local in that what the, the general gist of what we're trying to do is deconstruct historical policy and infrastructure barriers that have manifest over the course of a century plus in our city, very similar to other cities across the United States that have created a tale of two cities. You know, Dallas is one of the most segregated cities in the United States of America, and that doesn't just pop up out of thin air, nor does it pop up out of just white flight. Way too much credit is given to this concept of white flight. In fact, a lot of white flight manifests because of policies pushing people to leave the city. But we're trying to deconstruct these barriers through the lens of housing, through the lens of transportation, to a degree through the lens of education, that we just, we need to do. And there's a reckoning that has been coming on this stuff. I think some of it you could see in this past year's protest. People want these things worked on and they know that their elected leaders for the most part have failed them in actually coming to terms with the effects of policy that our forefathers laid. So Atlanta's facing the same things. New York's facing the same things. Seattle's facing the same things. We think that there is a model here for other cities across the United States. And, you know, looking at what Pete wants to do in the Department of Transportation, who will play a critical role in reshaping infrastructure moving forward, actually delivering on the infrastructure week that never happened (laughs) these past four years. Pete's going to start to do some of the things that I think dovetail real well with the work that we're doing, including rethinking where highways go or where they should come down, among other things. Well, you touched upon, I think, an issue for another podcast, and that's your story about your daughter. And uh, I think a lot of Dallasites know the story. Quickly, tell us a little bit about that and its impact on you personally. You should know that my wife and I, I we didn't talk at all about my wife. My wife has a very interesting story herself. She is half Mexican, and the other half of her family is German and a few other things. But her family came from Monterrey, Mexico, her mom's side of the family. And she ended up being, their family grew up just a few streets down from where my family grew up. We didn't know it, but Jacqueline and I, did. my wife, didn't know it growing up. It's a very similar story, the way her family came to America and just would do the same thing just three or four streets down the road from, from ours. But Jacqueline and I fell in love in middle school. We got married five years ago and decided we wanted to have a child, did everything we thought we needed to do to set that birth and child up for success. And the day that my daughter was born, we realized there was something very wrong with her health, which then turned into a diagnosis of a congenital heart disease, which then led to a procedure on her fifth day of life that stopped her heart, an hour of uh, CPR, being placed on life support, life support leading to a few strokes, and then the necessity to have a heart transplant. And then it, on her three month birthday, having a heart transplant and everything that has come with that since then. But the good news is twofold. One, she's doing very well. And 
you could look at my daughter and assume nothing happened to my daughter for the most part. And that is a blessing. And God is great. The other thing is it taught me a lot about myself. I think it taught my wife a lot about herself. It taught us a lot about our relationship and also about the gift that comes with privilege and what happens when you don't have a lot of the things that my, my wife and I have, including the social network that we've got to support us along the way. There were Latino families that were in the same cardiac ICU that we lived in with us for four or five months who only spoke Spanish and had to navigate that process that way. And I remember trying to be a broken translator for some of these families as they were having to make life and death decisions. So again, full circle, it's just this idea that there's still this need from, from our community and one that I, I have to reflect on the privilege that I've been, I've been given just one generation removed from my grandmother and how we have to look out for each other as a community along the way. This has been a great hour. Thank you, Miguel, for your time. Thank you for your story. I think it, it's fascinating, number one. It's important. It's inspirational. And it's who we are. And I think you embody, I think for many people, what it means to have our and share our experience as Latinos here in Texas. And I'm excited to see what's next. I'm, of course, watching all the time. And you and I are friends otherwise. I know that you and I trade guitar licks sometimes. One more Attempted point. guitar licks. Uh, well, you're, you're much better than I am. A quick remembrance on my wall hangs some memorabilia from when I went and visited the country of Israel and you were on that trip with me. And one night late on the Sea of Galilee, as we were having a wonderful dinner on the water, uh, you and I got into a rap battle. That's right. <laughs> I, think, I think you won handily. I had more of the Holy Spirit with me in the process. <laughs> so, on, I mean, think about that. We were having a rap battle on the sea that Jesus walked on. Jesus walked kind of, I think JC would be proud. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great time. But it, to me, that's when I think you and I became really good friends. And I've always appreciated your friendship. So thank you for being on today. At the Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation, you can continue to hear our story, hopefully weekly. If you want to find us online, you can go to txhpf.org, or you can find us on Twitter at TEXHPF, and then on Facebook at Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation. God bless. Thanks so much. We look forward to seeing you next time on Our Story. The Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation would like to thank you for joining us today on Our Story. You can find more information about the foundation at www.txhpf.org, on Facebook, on the Texas Hispanic Policy Foundation page, or on Twitter, at TexHPF. Please join us next week on Our Story, a podcast dedicated to the voices of Texas Hispanics.